Welcome to Guitar Gavel, a place for people who love guitars. These are conversations with musicians, guitar enthusiasts, techs, and collectors about their guitar journey and their love of the instrument. Thanks for tuning in. Please hit the subscribe button, share with your friends, and be sure to sign up for our twice weekly newsletter at guitargavel.com. Welcome back, everybody. This is David Still with the Guitar Gavel Podcast, and I'm joined once again with Brian Stoltz, musician, guitar player. Some could say jack of all trades. I would say jack of all trades in, in, in many regards. And Brian is back again. We're going to be talking about his, his album that's out, April 2nd, New World Rising. Last week we kind of got to know Brian a little bit. This week we're gonna we're gonna dig a little more, dig a little deeper in this episode. And Brian, welcome back, man. I'm glad to have you, man. Thanks so much for being here. Hey David, how's it going? Man, it's good, man. How are things down in Louisiana today? Wonderful, beautiful, good. sunny day. Enjoying this. We we are uh, where I'm at. We are fogged over in Western North Carolina. It looks like January out here. Oh my God! We're we're, we're 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 moving we're moving forward and we're moving into spring. And we're 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 moving into the album release. And you know, last week as we we kind of gave we talked about the ninety thousand foot view. So we kind of talked from the beginning all the way up into now. What we what we thought we share is a little bit more about your early influences, and then lead into talking about the new album, but holding off on going super in depth on it. Cause we're going to come back and do that in the next episode. Good. Good. Very cool. Very cool. So, you know, we, we talked last week about the, your, the Beatles influence on you picking up the hand-me-down guitar, getting some learning from your cross the street neighbor who was, who was a professional guitar player, professional musician, and then gigging before you're out of high school playing in bars and honky tonks and juke joints and then moving on from there. So we kind of want to go go back to that and maybe post high school and, and up and coming and, 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 and finding your path and your voice uh, in Southern Louisiana and New Orleans and, and how that came about. Yeah, well, you know, very early on before Beatles was out, you know, my, my mother was, my mother had a lot of records, you know, she had a lot of, old Fats Domino records, and she listened to everything from that to, uh, you know, really bad elevator type, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. I can't remember the guy's name. She used to all the time, but it was just awful, you know. But she had some good records too, you know. But, you know, music, back then music, it, I didn't really get a visceral reaction. It was just something that was there, you know. Yeah. I was never, ever really moved by it. Although I liked it, and I listened to the radio a lot, um, and I played her records a lot, but you know when I first when it, those first few Beatles songs came out, that just bowled me over. You know that was the first time I remember having a really strong reaction to and being moved about music. You know, and um, and it and it was you know that first initiation really opened some doors though because. At that point, I started to really listen closer, and I started to uh, I, I started being moved by other things, you know. Yeah. Um, although nothing back then, nothing quite touched, you know, Beatle records, you know, when that new song came on the radio, or you know, when that album came out, you know. Uh, I remember getting that first Meet the Beatles album. The Beatles were coming to town; they came to New Orleans. And um, it's a f funny story. Like e even before the Beatles came in September of '64, and the Mardi Gras before that, I remember we were at a parade, and all the horses, all the police horses in the parade, had these little square stickers on the nose of the horse, and it was just four mop tops, and it just said "They're coming." <laughs> and uh and I remember I, I remember asking my mother, what is that? What is that about? You know? And my mother told me, oh, the Beatles are coming. And so they came in September and I was just dying to go. And my mother just wouldn't hear it. She wouldn't get me a ticket. You know, I was eight years old at the time, uh, nine years old at the time. 
And I imagine she had heard all of the talk about, you know, people getting stamped, st st you know, getting yeah. stomped into the ground and, you know, stampeded. So I, I was so upset because she wouldn't buy me a ticket. I was been really upset for like a week. And then I think it was the day of the show. You know, she came home from work and she had brought me that the first Beatle album. She bought Meet the Beatles. So that kind of soothed things over, you know. Um, I still wish I could have went. Yeah. But um, but that soothed it over having that first album. Man, I just wore that thing out until the next one came out, you know. Yeah. That, that was really the beginning of it. And um, just the sound of those guitars, the whole thing. But to tell you the truth, though, I, I really wanted to be a drummer at that point, you know, because I used to... I used to pull the bar stools up together and beat on them with pencils. You know, I wanted to play drums. And um, my mother said, man, there ain't no way. You know, it ain't going to happen. You ain't going to be banging on them things in the house. She <laughs> said, you learn an instrument. She said, you learn a real instrument first. And I said, well, that is a real instrument. <laughs> you know, but she, wasn't, she, she wouldn't hear it. And then around that same time, that uncle of mine gave me an old Regal acoustic. And I started banging on that. So that took care of that. You know. <laughs> <laughs> similar drum store my dad was a drummer and uh you know in, in the fourth grade in elementary school is when you could go out for the for the band and so he got out his old snare drum and get, and showed me a couple things so i was like a little ahead of the curve going into tryouts if you will and uh man they put me on the trumpet <laughs> I, I, I haven't gotten over it since, man. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hard to rock on a trumpet when you're starting out. Oh, exactly, yeah. exactly. The, you know, the the Beatles, their their impact on on culture, history, the musical world cannot be overstated. Cannot Absolutely. be overstated, and yeah. it, it um. Is there any way for you to to articulate, and it's okay if not, any way for you to articulate just exactly that feeling, the what what consumed you or overwhelmed you? What was was there anything specific about the Beatles, or was it just something you had never heard before and it just lit you on fire? Yeah, it was just such a it was just such a new sound, you know. Yeah, and and you know I'm saying that that was the first the first time I really got a, a reaction like that, but that's not really true because even before that, uh, I remember, I, which I would I guess I would consider the first initiation would be at a Mardi Gras parade, and you know the band would be you know the band would be a couple of blocks away, but you know, playing as they're marching up the street. And I just remember the sound of that big bass drum, you know, yeah. you know, hearing the music, but I just remember those drum beats, you know, and that was kind of like the first time I ever really got moved by music, you know, like that, you know, and, that, and it being live right there, you know, it was just such a strong thing, you know, and then, and then I started really noticing, you know, songs off the radio after Beatles came out, you know, yeah, but right. you know, the thing, about Beatles, you know, Beatles music sounds so simple and it's not necessarily simple. You know, when you start working out some of those songs and you look at the chord changes, man, those guys are way ahead of their time for being you know, in their early 20s. I mean, that that stuff was phenomenal. I mean, those songs are really much, even the pop stuff, you know, at the beginning, had much more depth than anything else on the radio. Um, those chord changes wasn't simple chord changes all the time, you know, and and they wasn't always something you could just pick up by ear, you know. At least for me, you know. Sure. Um, so I think I think it's very deceiving how uh, simplistic it may sound when in in in, uh, in reality it's not. You know, they're, they're not really easy songs necessarily. Right. The um, musical history will try to distill down music, rock and roll from the 50s and 60s to three chords. Right. Yeah. You know, three chords you can play 70 percent. What I'm making up numbers, you know, yeah. and, and, it, and it and while you can. There's more yeah. to it than that. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of the early stuff was the three chord stuff and simple, you know, one, six, four, five changes, things like that, but not all of it, you know. And as they moved on, it got more and more complex, you know. When when you the Beatles being a big influence, and then obviously where you grew up, there's so much history, there's so much yeah. culture, there, there's so so much musicality to New Orleans. Was there, was there, did you interweave the two early on? Did you kind of follow, I'm, you know, this is my, when I'm practicing and when I'm playing, I'm playing Beatles stuff and then I'm playing what's, what, what's more roots music close to me. Did you blend the two? Was there any marrying of the different musical styles at an early age? No, I think they were linked, you know, because, you know, at the same time I was listening to that, you know, like I tell you in the last um, episode, New Orleans had great radio stations and, you know, they'd have like, like I said, a pop station that played everything from Beatles to fast domino and local stuff. But then they also had a couple of R and B stations, um, WBOK and uh, WYLD that played R and B and soul music. And, um, and all day long, I would just go back and forth between you know, WTIX and then WBOK and WYLD, whoever had the best song at the time, they got to listen, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, but the, the WBOK, WYLD was incredible, you know, to hear, you know, James Brown and Aretha Franklin and, and just all the current stuff of that, you know, that era, the R&B stuff and soul, soul song. We didn't have the word funk back then. You know, it was soul music, you know? Yeah. James Brown was the king of soul. Rita Franklin was the queen of soul, and um, and and Motown was happening, and that's probably as big an influence on me than anything. Okay. Uh, that's easily equal to the Beatle influence, you know, because Motown. I, I still listen. To, I still listen every day. I got a Motown playlist of about 130 songs on it that I put on every morning and, and, and get, you know, barely get into it, you know, before I got to turn it off and go to work. But, um, but I still listen to that every day, just about, because it's just so just timeless music, you know? Right. It is. And you're, so you, you're, you've, you're a melting pot of all the, all the sounds, all the songs, all the tunes you were hearing of the time. What was that? And you, in, in back in our last episode, you mentioned you know the radio station was not genre specific so much. You could you could hear multiple genres on the same station. Were your friends in in your 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 you know your circle at that time? Were they listening to everything? Were they all over the place, such as yourself? Or, or were people starting to focus in on different genres? And I I listen to this, and I don't listen to that kind of a thing. Yeah, it, it was uh, kind of mixed because. Um... You know, I remember, you know, back then we had frats and hoods, okay? You was either a frat or a hood. I was I was dead in the middle, you know, because, you know, like all my cousins, they considered themselves tough guys, you know? And they listened to the R&B stations. They listened to WBOK, WYLD. They were into James Brown, you know, that kind of stuff, you know? And I love that, too. I, I had to go back and forth, though, you know? They didn't want to have anything to do with the pop stuff, you know. They were they were straight from the street, you know. Yeah. yeah. But um, I, I think honestly, all my like school friends, they all lean toward just the pop stuff and the Beatle end of it. Um, when it came to you know my cousins and some of my family, you know, it was they went on the other side. You know, they were they were listening to R and B and soul music, you know, and I just had to have it all. You know, I had to have all of it. When you first, once you got, a, you know, enough talent uh, playing the guitar, what, what did you lean into early on when you were playing the guitar kind of music? When I, well, when I, when I first started to really get around on it, yeah. by the time I was maybe uh, 12 or 13 or something, you know, at that point, you know, Hendrix was out, you know. I mean, once I heard that, man, there were periods where that's all I would listen to. Yeah. I wouldn't even listen to anything else. I was just so absorbed in that, that's all I could listen to, you know. Yeah. Um, 
So right off the bat, I've kind of leaned toward blues, you know, from the Hendrix stuff. Um, I didn't realize, I didn't realize it at first, you know, that I was, it was nothing but blues, you know, it was a little later on before I really realized that I just knew it was really unique and a new sound and, you know, nobody had taken the guitar to this level, you know? Um, so for a long time, it was, uh, I just listened to Jimmy and there was a period where I listened to nothing but Jimi Hendrix and Johnny Winter. You know, yeah. I discovered Johnny Winter when that first, when that Johnny Winter and album, live album came out, you know? And then in 70, in 1970, a club opened up in New Orleans called The Warehouse. It was like a 150-year-old cotton warehouse sitting on a river, sitting on the Mississippi River. Held about 3,500 people. Wow. And man, I was in there every chance I could get, you know? And uh, saw Johnny Winter in there a bunch of times. But um, but that first that not first album, but that first live album that he had, yeah, that bowled me over, you know, for a long time. That's all I could listen to is Hendrix and, and Johnny Winter. Well, know. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. When, when you were at the warehouse, were you were you just staring at Johnny Winter? Were you just staring at guitar? You know, the band's guitar player, or, or were you there for the whole for the whole experience? I mean, where where were you kind of? In your now, depending on who it was, but I was usually able to. Well, I, I was never there for like the whole experience. You know, you wouldn't want to be there for the whole experience. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it was a pretty crazy joint. But um, no, I was there for the music. I was there for the bands, you know, for yeah. sure. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, I don't really like crowds that much. Uh, so it has to be somebody pretty good to get me in the middle of a crowd. Gotcha. You know, <laughs> when, when later on, when you realized where Hendrix, Hendrix, Hendrix's roots were, did you start to go? Did you start to follow the roots? Did that yeah. change? Change where you were? Yeah. Yeah, it was because of guys like Jimmy and Johnny Winter that, you know, I started looking at where where they come from. Where what did they listen to? You know, I always wanted to know what they listened to. So yeah, that naturally led me to Albert King and. And Sun House and Muddy Waters and you know people like that. You know old Otis Rush. You know you hear you you can hear a lot of Otis Rush and Johnny Winter. You know, and then Jimmy. You know you heard a lot of Albert King, Freddie King, uh, Earl King uh, from New Orleans. Uh, Jimmy recorded one of Earl's tunes. You know, and I always knew he was a fan of Earl King's because I somebody long time ago somebody gave me a bootleg. Uh, a cassette of Jimmy playing in some little club in, in uh, the village in 1965. Wow. And um, he did a version of Alan Toussaint's uh, Get Out My Life Woman, a, a song first recorded by Lee Dorsey. And man, when he went into the solo, you swore you was listening to Earl King. It was, it sounded mm -hmm. exactly like Earl. So I could tell at that point, Oh yeah, he not only recorded some of Earl, he was really listening to Earl too, you know. Yeah, yeah. You last last time we hung out, you talked about you know the, the jazz scene in in New Orleans, and um, I'm curious, you know, as you're as you're as you're going, it was kind of a, as you're getting into your late teens and early twenties, obviously you know an accomplished guitar player at that point, right? I mean, at, at a bare minimum, you're an accomplished gigging guitar player. That was already working, yeah. yeah, yeah, and I mean, that's what you were doing for for a living at this point, and have been for in many regards. So, w did you start to pull in more New Orleans influences at all, or was it still? Um, yeah, a little bit. You know, I mean, you couldn't couldn't help. I mean, living here, you can't help but, you know, you can't help that because it's yeah. it's in it's it's everywhere. You know, sure. Um. Everywhere you go, you you know, and, and a lot of people in New Orleans, that's all they listen to. I mean, it's as if the rest of the world didn't exist, you know. There's a lot of musicians in New Orleans that's that's really all they know. They they're not aware of much else mm -hmm. out there, you know, which is a beautiful thing, I think, you know. Yeah. Um, so you couldn't help but not be exposed to New Orleans music, you know. 
And like I said, from early on, the radio stations, you know, they'd play, you know, Chris Kenner and Lloyd Price and, and uh, Fats Domino, early uh, Alan Toussaint, um, later on, the Beaters, you know, and things like that. So you always heard that music on local radio, you know? Yeah. Um, but I, I, at the beginning, you know, I imagine it took a few years before I really started to play stuff like that. Um, as I got out, like I'd say mid seventies, mid seventies on, yeah, I started bands that I was with. We started doing meter tunes and, um, other local tunes, you know, Alan Toussaint songs, things like that, you know, cause he had so many great songs. Um, but from that period on, you know, yeah, I've always studied the New Orleans catalog. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then you had to, you had to play disco for a little while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was unfortunately like um, I guess around seventy seven or seventy eight, something like that. It was a couple of year period where, if you wanted to work, that's what you had to do. It was yeah. either that or you had to go find a day job somewhere, and I wasn't gonna do that. Sure, sure, that wasn't gonna happen because uh, I don't really know anything else, you know. So I don't know what I would have did, but so yeah, I had a sell the marshals and <laughs> sell the marshals buy a little small lamp and a suit, <laughs> a cheap suit. and i started working um around there was a part of town called fat city out of jefferson parish and they had a lot of disco clubs out there so i started working some of those clubs and that helped me over until i started working bourbon street and got back to a little little better music again I mean, there, there's a there's a, there's a ton of town, a ton of talent in New Orleans, and yeah. how did you how did you how did you separate yourself or make you? I don't want to say make yourself shine. I mean, how, how did you cut through all all of the all of the noise? And I mean, noise in a in a good way, not in a bad way. To to put yourself in a position to 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 get to to talk to to Art and Aaron and get an invitation to the to to audition. To talk to who? Art and Aaron. Oh, well, you know, I've been I'm playing jumping clubs. Around. I fast forwarded on you a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I've been uh playing clubs like on Bourbon Street. And um I worked with a a big horn a horn band group called Mojo playing Local stuff, playing hits off the radio, top 40 stuff, whatever, you know. And um, and then I moved across the street to the, that was at the Ivanhoe, the club where Meters first started out. And uh, one of the clubs they started out in. And I moved across the street to the 544 Club, but began playing there. And um, Rita Coolidge used to come in all the time. Cause she was a fan of the band and um, I was playing there with a, a sax player named Gary Brown. Gary's a great, great saxophone player. He's on a lot of Alan Toussaint's productions on a lot of BG's records. He's played with a lot of people, you know, and I was working down there with him and Rita was a big fan. So she used to come in the club all the time and I got to know her. And then one day, one night she came in and she had Art and Aaron Neville with her. And that's where I, that's where I first met them. Okay. Um, and then after that, Art began coming in on his own and just hanging out, you know. So that's how. And then when they decided on, a, when Neville's decided on a new band, he came looking for me. <laughs> so, you know, the rest is history. <laughs> the rest is history. <laughs> In your in your journey with the Neville brothers, um, I, I don't want to ask what what the favorite time. I, I just think musicality wise, what was did you have a favorite time with your decade with them? You know, in terms of of albums or or the projects y'all were working on, or was it was it just one you know ten year party, man? I mean, in a good ten ten year love affair with their music. Yeah, I wouldn't exactly call it a party. <laughs> yeah. I don't call any gig and party. Um, um, I imagine God, there was so many great periods, you know, because every period 
you know, I have some great landmark on just about every period, you know, from the very beginning, being on the Stones tour to every summer we would go out with some, you know, headline artists like Santana or Ziggy Marley, um, Huey Lewis, you know, people like that. And um, in 80, I think it was 80, um, it was either 84 or 86, we did the um, Amnesty International Conspiracy, the very first Conspiracy of Hope tour, which was a tour uh, raising awareness and money um, uh, over political prisoners around the world. And um, that tour was uh, the Nevilles, Joan Baez, and we also backed up Joan. Uh, the police, U2, Peter Gabriel, Lou Reed. Uh, and then when we got to New York, a giant stadium, they added artists like Miles Davis and uh, Fela was on it. When we got to L.A., they had Bob Dylan, uh, Tom Petty, you know, a bunch of different artists. But the main tour was police, U2. Uh, uh, Peter Gabriel, Lou Reed, Neville's, Joan Baez. Um, so, but I, I would have to say the most enjoyable period was do, making Yellow Moon album, yeah. um, which was 88, you know. Uh, making the Yellow Moon album was a great experience. Working with Daniel Lanois was a great experience. I learned a lot from him. Learned a lot from that whole session. Yeah. That That session, having a a lasting impact on your career and your success in the, in the nineties and then even producing your first albums. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, it taught me how to produce, you know, it taught me, you know, I made sure I kept my ears and eyes open, you know, cause yeah. I knew, I mean, I was working with, you know, I, I knew I was working with someone, you know, very unique. And then Brian Eno also came in and worked for a couple of weeks with us on that record. So, yeah, I made sure I absorbed as much as I possibly could, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's free. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it was it was eye-opening, you know, because those guys don't play around, you know. Yeah. Dan, very beginning of the project, Dan told me, you know, this isn't, this isn't going to be easy. He said, but I promise you, you're going to learn something that's going to be worth it. Mm -hmm. And he was he was right. You know, it wasn't easy. Um, you know, those guys are straightforward. You know, they tell you what time of day it is. They don't play around, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, they had to work, you know. Yeah. And um, so you got to have a little bit of a thick skin. You know, you had to have a thick skin playing with Neville Brothers anyway. Um, but... Uh, he was right. You know, it wasn't easy, but I learned a whole lot. That's for sure. I, I learned really how to make a record, you know, how records are put together and what works, what don't work, you know, what can work, what doesn't necessarily work, you know, um, how to get a strong foundation, you know, all the basics, you know. And you've, you've in your career been, been very fortunate to spend a lot of time in the studio you know, you Brian, and it may, I don't. I'm going to present this because I know it's not just me, but I'll present maybe my fascination with rock and roll as a kid because it, it, you, you you dream like I don't know, maybe from the movies or, or wherever you get this this persona, this perception that it is. You go to the you go to the studio. It's a party, right? You you bang out a song, man. You call it a night. You go party some more, and you know you and, and you're getting paid and all this, but it's Clearly, that's that's not the case. Yeah, that's not the case. <laughs> it can be, but maybe, right? Maybe for for there's instances in history where that has been has happened for some, but it's real work and it's real hard work. Can you can you just give an example for those that you know may have lived in a fairy fairy tale land like myself as a teenager or for, for a 15 year old that's watching or listening? Tell them what it's like, man. Well, you know, it de depends on the artist because. There is a lot of sessions that go down in New Orleans that just is nothing but a party. Yeah. And, you know, and I've been on a lot of those too, you know. Um, unfortunately, you don't get as much work done. Right. Um, 
I guess probably the most disciplined one was the Bob Dylan sessions. Um, we we did Bob Dylan's Oh Mercy album in 80, uh, late 88, I believe it was, or early 89. And, um, and yeah, there was no fooling around on that session. You know, Bob came in, he was, he, you could tell what was on his mind when he walked in, his mind was on those songs. You immediately went to work and it was nothing 100% work until we finished, you know. Wasn't no small talk. No fooling around, you know, no real breaks. You worked, you know. Um, and that was, you know, it was a little tense at times. It could be tense. It was it was mostly enjoyable, you know, it was really great. But um, no, it wasn't a party for, by any stretch. Yeah, yeah. Um, but those exist sometimes too. But you know. Whenever I've been in with somebody like that, anybody on that level, you know, it's always work. It's work. Right. You know, the clock's ticking. Studios cost money. You know, it's work. You know. And that 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 can be said for any discipline or any occupation, right? And yeah. To be, to, sure. to be truly great, you've got to put in the reps. You've yeah. got to do, you've got to do the work. No matter yeah. if you're a rock and roll star or a professional athlete, it's the same. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, let's, let's now we've got a little more, you know, in-depth view of of, um, of the foundations of Brian Stoltz. Let's talk about the latest album. And we, we, again, we're, we're going to save some of the, some of the in-depth stuff for the album for for our next conversation. But man, you you know, been been listening to it since since we we're able to connect on it, and, and you've got a lot to say. You got a lot to say in this album. And uh, what what is what does New World Rising mean mean to you, man? Well, one is just a title I had in my mind for a long time because I can see, you know, we're def we're definitely on the cusp of some whole new thing, you know. Um, I think times are changing and they're changing fast, and I think it's going to get faster and faster. Um, but, you know, but the songs. The songs fit in that mold in the respect that I'm talking about. Just different things, fidelity, and talking about loyalty. I'm talking about just different things we go through in life, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that's all what you make of it yourself, you know? So the songs come from a lot of different angles. But, um, and, and again, like we said, we talk about that in the next episode, um, breaking those down. You know, really breaking them down song by song. But um, but in general, you know, I just, you know, I'm just writing about the things that I go through, the things that I see, the things that I anticipate coming, you know. Yeah. And um, and it can be all good, you know. It can be good. Have you, when did you start writing songs? In, and um, I know you, you some of these songs have been around, you know, uh, on the album yeah. you've had for a while. But but when yeah. did you start writing? When did when did you really get into that? Has that been a lifelong pursuit, or is that someone someone? Uh, yeah, I've, yeah, I've always tried. Um, yeah. I think it was really it was probably around um, probably late seventies when I started getting it together a little bit better, and then. Um, and then once I joined Neville Brothers, I started writing more. Yeah. So I started writing songs with Cyril, with Cyril Neville, and um, some of the other guys. But um, yeah, I started getting more serious about it early '80s. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and wrote songs with Cyril. Wrote songs that came out on a couple of those albums early on. You know, back then. You know. And on New World Rising, did you did you all, did you write all the songs yourself, or did you collaborate on on any of them? Um, there's no collaborations on um, on this album. No, yeah, I wrote them all. Yeah, yeah. It makes it makes the paperwork a lot easier. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> That's very true, right? And, and did you record in the studio that you're sitting in? Right yeah. now, yeah, yeah, it's um, Sweet Mix Studio, 
in Slidell, Louisiana, owned by George Kiro, a great uh, engineer and producer here in town. And um, yeah, I've done, I've done, uh, I think all my records here except for the live album. Okay. Yeah. How many in in production time? How many hours did you have you did you spend in the studio putting the album together? Ooh. <laughs> All right. We didn't many, keep a log. We didn't keep a log, and thank God we didn't. Good. Um, uh, because, like I told you last episode, uh, some of these songs uh, I'd started working on back around the time I did God, Guns, and Money. Yeah. And uh, I got sidetracked and ended up doing that record. So I put everything on the side. And a few of these songs, yeah, I pulled out from back then. I couldn't just, I couldn't let them go. Sure. And um, some of them I re-recorded. Uh, probably most of them from back then I re-recorded. And um, a couple of them I didn't. Uh, and then there's some new new stuff too. But um, I, I have no idea how, how many hours we've got in on it. it yeah. It's 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 you know it's too much to count. Um, <laughs> right. right. I should yeah. have asked. You know, if I, I'd have had to go in, if I'd have had to go in, and you know, watch the clock at a studio at a thousand dollars a day, you know, yeah, I wouldn't have been able to make this record. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So luckily, George works with me. And we're able to get a good product out without killing ourselves looking at the clock, you know, because there's nothing worse than that when you're recording is having to look at the clock. Uh, just you just I don't hear great records done that way. Yeah, it takes uh, the artistry out of it. There's a lot of good records made that way, but there's not many great, great records done that way. Um, at least not anymore. You know, yeah. back in the day when you just went in and cut it and you recorded a performance, that's different, you know? Mm -hmm. um, nowadays, to have a really, to have the type of production that I want to have, it, it takes more time than that, you know? Because yeah. it's not just about capturing a good performance, you know? It's about using the studio as an instrument, you know? Mm -hmm. what, what What are you most proud of with this, with this album? Um... That I got it finished. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair that's, enough. The, that's the main thing that I got it finished. Um, you know, for a long time, it the, you know we had the tracks done for a while now, but when it came down to mixing, you know, I wanted I wanted like a really good hot shot mixer, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, y'all can't afford that. You know, it's twenty five hundred dollars a track or more. You know. Yeah. I didn't have 25 grand or, you know, 30 grand to mix a record, you know. So George and I started working on it, uh, you know, just slugging away at it. And um, and by taking our time and really paying attention to everything we did, you know, and doing some microsurgery, I think we got it in a good place, you know. Yeah. It, um, it sounds I great. I think it sounds good. I think the tracks sound great. George is a great engineer, so he gets everything down really well, and um, and he's been he's a good mixer. Um, it's just I I've always want more and more and more. You know, I want to be able to compete with the best out there. You know, so I always had it in my head that I'd want you know some real hot shot mixer today, but couldn't do that. So we took our time and and really didn't. It wasn't considered finished until we were content with what we had, That's until cool. we knew we couldn't top what we had, you know? I mean, you can always do more, but that doesn't necessarily make it better. You know, a lot of times you go down that rabbit hole and you'll dig yourself a deep hole that you'll never crawl out of. But we, so we got it to where we knew this is the best we can do for right now. And then I had Greg Calby master it. So it has a great mastering job on it. It sounds really terrific. It, you know? it sounds great. Brian, you know, you mentioned using the studio as an instrument, like Phil Spector or, or Brian Wilson. And and um I think you I think you did that, man. 
from, from what I've heard. I really think you did. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah, you should feel good about that. Yeah, we use the studio to the best of its facility. I mean, it's, you know, I squeezed every bit out of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so April 2nd, the full album, the full album is available. And right now you're trickling out singles on, on Fridays. And uh, yeah. Yeah. And just, uh, yeah. You Can Never Die was the first single. Uh, the second one was Somewhere, uh, Someday I'll Have Mine. And um, this last Friday, oh, it was today Friday? Yeah, this morning. Yeah, Mirror, Mirror. Uh, Mirror, Mirror came out. Yeah. It hit mm -hmm. at midnight. Yeah. They're, they're all, they all, all the singles are coming out at midnight. Uh, on Fridays. Okay. Okay. And they hit Spotify and Apple Music, iTunes, if you want to purchase it. Uh, you know, all the regular streaming services. Right. Right. And I'll link to that in the show notes as well as your, you know, Instagram and Facebook where everybody can can find you and then, you know, everyone can can click on the links and go straight, listen wherever they want to listen. That's the yeah. that's the the good and bad part, right? Easy to yeah. find. Is, you, it just yeah, music ain't <laughs> music ain't really free. <laughs> yeah, well, so, it pretty much is when you're talking about <laughs> streaming. It might as well. Yeah, be. I mean, yeah. There's but there's a generation coming up thinking that's that's the case, but it's not. It's not. Well, yeah, Brian, you know, I mean, streaming it, it's a it's an incredible thing for the consumer, you know. Yeah. And I I gotta admit, as much as I curse it for you know, taking away my, most of my livelihood. Um, man, there's nothing better than being able to find any song in the world that you want right at your fingertips, yeah. you know? Um, and I use, uh, I use Tidal, which is, uh, Tidal is a streaming service that streams lossless. So you can listen up to 24-bit, uh, 192K, depending yeah. on what your phone can handle. Uh, and man, it just sounds so far superior to any of the other. I think the only other one that streams lossless like that is Apple Music. Um, the rest of them are bumped down to, you know, 256K or something like that. It just doesn't sound as good, no, you know? No, no. I, th I think that's the next wave in streaming music, not having the compressed audio files. Um, yeah. They can really listen to it how it's hear it how it's supposed to sound yeah um yeah so ne next time we come back we're gonna we're gonna look at a lot of the tracks all the tracks and we're gonna we're gonna talk about those and and you know we'll hear a little on the production end you know some on the artistry side of, of the lyrics and then of course on the instrumental side as well and uh really looking forward to that i mean it's hot man it's it's a it's a a great album um you just got it to me a couple days ago. I got more time to play with it before we hang out next time. But it's been Good. a lot of fun. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of different stuff on this record. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It, at first, I was concerned about it being too much of a variety pack. But then I realized, you know, nobody, you know, people don't listen to albums anymore. Uh, not really. <laughs> except right. old timers like me. And I started listening to a lot of current records that was out and man they're all like that you know they all have a lot of different genres going on you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. and then when you're putting out singles it doesn't matter you know right. when people are basically approaching it like that too they hear the single that's out they're not really looking for the album necessarily then it's fine you know so i'm happy with the way it came out good it, it was tough to sequence but um you know I tried to do a few different ones hit on the one I did. Who knows? You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's I, I think it works. I think it works both ways. I think it works well as an album and it definitely works well as if you just listen in the individual singles. You know? did, do you feel like that took the pressure off a bit by just not having to have, have an album that tells, you know, tells us a story, a story or it's something succinct. You just get to do what you want to do. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, ironically, it still does that, you know, it kind of all came together anyway, you know, yeah. Um, because, you know, I'm only writing about so many things, you know, right. so it kind of came out that way anyway. Uh, there's, there's definitely a thread running through it, although the 
the production is drastically different on a lot of songs, you know, because, you know, like uh, the, the duet I had with uh, Shannon McNally, yeah. it's more of a classic country sound, you know, um, the, the, the closing cut bow down on Sunday is more of a gospel piece, you know? Yeah, it's powerful. And, um, and the rest of it's somewhere in the middle. You know, it either rocks or it uh, was laid back, you know? Yeah. Um, so there's a few different genres going on here, but I think they come together well. I think they work well together. I think so, too. And like today's Mirror Mirror has got a little little, little funky beat in there. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, no, nah, you, you, I don't think you've, you've done no wrong, man, only good. So I look forward to us talking in depth about it. Good, good. Good. What, what yeah, I think... Uh, uh, Mira, Mira, you know, early on, I would try to do stuff. And the only thing I heard from people was, where's the funk? Where's the funk? Mm -hmm. They wanted to know, where's the funk? Well, as a songwriter, I don't really, you know, I mean, look, I played with Funky Meters. I played with Neville Brothers. What could I possibly do that can top that? You know, what could I do that's going to be... <laughs> yeah equal to that or is or better than that or is good you know what i mean yeah so and just as a songwriter it usually comes out in different forms you know it comes out more of a singer songwriter or more of a rock blues rock type thing you know um you know funk is usually just some mindless element going on with it it's party music and it's you know, while there's a lot of tracks on here that I could say would fall into a, you could party with those songs, I, I wouldn't really classify it as a party record. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm uh, you. Although it could be, I guess. There's a lot of tunes on it that would fit into that, you know. But but that genre doesn't allow me, you know, you can't write about the things I want to write about and you can't really dig in deep with lyrics on those kind of grooves you know yeah yeah um so uh, with the exception of one song on there called chain which is kind of a fun groove and i've got like a stream of consciousness thing going over the top of it it kind of works well on that but but in general it's not an easy genre to write a lot about you know mm -hmm. um that calls calls some more repetitive lyrics and uh, a lot lighter listening, you know. Well, you, you, the, the, the ones that the creating the drum beat for a little funk and the Brian Stoltz fans, you know, you gave them just enough to chew on. So you're good. Yeah, yeah, that's on there. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah, they're half. They're half. Yeah. Why don't, uh, why don't we leave it, leave it here for now and right, come well. back next time and we'll do exactly what we've talked about and, um, and, look at this thing in depth. and shout out to Chris Kelly. Who's supposed to be on here with us right now? He just Where called me. It, Chris? He called me a few minutes ago. I wonder if I was supposed to answer, and I, I would hold my hold the phone up to the microphone. I don't know, but hopefully we can get him on next week. We'll get him on next week. I'll take care of him before before we all come together. I'll get I'll get Chris on and, and lock him in place. Yeah, we'll have the hog tub. We're gonna have to drive to Austin and tie him up. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Brian, well, this has been a lot of fun, man. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Yeah, David, I appreciate it once again. Thank you so much and look forward to it. And, um, yeah, we'll talk again next week. You got it, man. Thanks so much. Everybody, thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next one. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the Guitar Gavel Podcast, and a special thanks to Steve Kuykendall for composing this music and being such the great guy and friend that you are. As a reminder, hit the subscribe button and sign up for our twice-weekly newsletter at guitargavel.com.